I would like to begin by acknowledging country of the unceded lands of Badigal country of where my current employment sits, uh, which is the Sydney Environment Institute of the University of Sydney. And I would like to pay my deepest respects to the traditional owners, past, present, and emerging. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give you a keynote speech to you all today. I'm very happy to be here. So my talk today explains how we can understand indigenous survivance through the persistence of complex human and orangutan relations in spite of neo-colonial conservation enclosures, which seek to securitize orangutans as biodiversity and control humans as a threat thereto. Indigenous peoples are by no means passive bystanders to these encounters as communities contend with conservation related interventions on their lands. They selectively conceal and obscure important aspects of their lives in an effort to manage their relationships with the NGOs, government agencies, and other actors involved. What do these acts of concealment and innovation mean in relation to larger struggles around dispossession and environmental degradation? So this talk is partly based on an article I recently published in the Journal of Cultural Studies and through analysis of indigenous naming practices, knowledges and narratives, I advocate uh, for relating to orangutans, not as objects to protect, but instead as beings to, to coexist with. This I propose is what it takes to sustain wild orangutans as more than an abstracted species with conservation value. So currently in conservation research and practice, there's a greater push to use digital technologies. And sometimes these technologies can be overemphasized at the expense of ethics. So in the beginning of my research, I had conceptualized using more of these tools, um, such as GIS mapping for my work. But as I worked together with the communities, I realized there was a greater story uh, to be told beyond the tools I had hoped to use. And in some cases, there was fatigue of mapping territories and the people I had worked with were more concerned in communicating why these territories matter and their customary practices and relations, why these matter. So as activists and scholars, we have been conditioned to think of institutional uh, visibility as a form of empowerment for social politically invisible populations and therefore also a necessary part of accountable research. Uh, from this perspective, one important way to challenge misguided conservation policies would be to document and make visible that um, which they misapprehend or distort. But we have come to question this notion, um, no Thoreau and I, as a result of our respective research engagements with indigenous communities in Sarawak, Malaysian Borneo, and Palawan in the Philippines. Does the will to make visible, even among critical scholars and activists, unconsciously reproduce the impulse that drives the instrumentalizing uh, documentation of traditional ecolo ecology knowledge or the one that drives the discovery and doc documentation and the securitization of new and threatened species? So with these concerns in mind, we have come together to interrogate the assumption that documentation, whether digital or otherwise, and institutional visibility are inevitable prerequisites to protecting biodiversity or defending indigenous land rights. And we wonder whether how we can serve not just to document or render visible, but also to defend spaces for the survivance and resurgence of indigenous world-making practices. So in other words, how can we best challenge harmful misconceptions while respecting protocols of consumer innovation but we don't pretend to answer these questions in any definitive way, uh, but we hope to inspire more critical reflection on the limits of visibility as a means of supporting indigenous survivance and of defending more than human assemblages or relationships from dispos dispossession. So I'd like to set the scene of where this research is premised on. So for several decades, uh, there have been large scale deforestation encroachment in indigenous territories in Sarawak, Malaysia, and Borneo. So, Borneo is divided into three um, territories Malaysia, Indonesia, and Brunei. Uh, 
and I'm speaking about the Malaysian Borneo. So the idea of rural poverty, of being tertinggal or left behind, has led to Sarawak's quest to accelerate land development over the past 40 years uh, since independence. So this meant the, va the vast transformation of Sweden farming subsistence to intensive rural development of large scale cash crop plantations and modern infrastructure, including roads, electricity, and piped water. So further, rural natives are constantly pressured to participate in the market economy through large scale commercial plantation agriculture. So with state aspirations to develop land for agriculture and other mega industries, this has led to conserve the remaining lands for forestry and wildlife conservation purposes. So the dream of development has become a nightmare for many rural native communities, producing labor exploitation and land tenure insecurity, including because of the creation of protected areas, i.e. national parks. And particularly in, when we look at conservation literature, rural natives, um, peoples of Borneo and elsewhere are often written off as unruly and they represent a constant threat to nature and wildlife and thus have to be managed in different ways. In this context, mapping customary territories as to assert claims to lands has been an important practice in indigenous activism in Sarawak and elsewhere in Borneo. So markets such as old durian and fruit orchards and stony op crops and river boundaries are often used to demarcate boundaries um, of an indigenous territory. So a bit on my positionality, I, I, I mean, I, I mentioned in the Borneo, I worked um, as a pasta for conservation um, biologist, and I had a change of heart, um, especially how we were working with the local communities in conservation and also my own positionality. Um, as a Badaya woman. So from the Latin Pongo, which means anthropoid ape, and Pygmaeus, which means a short or reduced stature, the Mayas are known as Pongo Pygmaeus in the scientific world, or more commonly as the orangutan. So for many familiar with the Indo-Malay region, it is often assumed that orangutan is a term that locals use to know and name the great ape. It is, after all, derived from the Malay words orang for person and utan or hutan for forest or person of the forest. However, as the Mayas, it's also found in regions where the Iban people have lived and thrived for at least 400 years. The Ibans have their own terms to identify and acknowledge the Mayas. So the non-indigenous origin of the term orangutan is little known outside the Mayas or Mawas, habitats of Sumatra and Borneo. In Sarawak, the orangutan is known as the Mayas in many variants that depend on its physical characteristics. And in Sumatra and other parts of Borneo, the orangutan is known as the Mawas. And there's no literary record of the Malay speaking peoples using the term orangutan as one of its variants to refer to the ape before the middle of the 19th century. And the first recorded Malay use of a term resembling orangutan to describe the ape identifies the term as a Western word. Um, the Hikayat Abdullah, which is a major literary record written in the 1840s by Abdullah bin Abdul Qadir, who's a uh, Malacca born Moshe from Singapore. He recounts the ruler of Samba sent Mr. Raffles a present of two apes of the kind, which the English call the orangutan. So this is a 16th century illustration of an orangutan. Uh, by the 17th and 18th centuries, orangutans that were presented to the Western audiences were creatures detached from the natural habitat, both literally and symbolically. When we think of the Linnaean classification and comparative anatomy, it pays little attention to where an animal came from as it did to its behavior. So the orangutan has loomed larger in the imagination of the West than it did in its native Borneo and Sumatra. In, in her seminal decolonizing methodologies book, Linda T. Y. Smith describes how naming is part of a colonizing methodology where renaming the land was probably as powerful ideologically as changing the land. Smith thus offers a countering decolonizing methodology to rename the world using original indigenous names 
and to retain as much control over meanings as possible. By naming the world, people name their realities. For communities, the realities which can only be found in indigenous language and the concepts which are self-evident in the indigenous language can never be recaptured by another language. And this is from Linda Tuya Smith. So in the years 2015 and 16, I conducted most of my field work at three Iban communities um, at the southwestern tip of Batan I and Lanjak and Tamal complex. So here people continue to live in the protected area complex and they have limited rights. So since the gazetting of the complex, um, seven communities in Batan I and 35 other communities in, in neighboring Lubok Antu, they have restricted privileges to hunt, fish, and gather jungle produce in their area for their own personal consumption, and they're not allowed to sell. And activities in the park are limited to farming of previously cultivated areas and gathering forest goods. So in return, the communities are said to benefit from employment, such as being wardens and park rangers, and they form their own cooperatives that provide transport and accommodation and guiding for visitors. So this complex is important because it's part of the Malaysian and Indonesian Transfrontier Protected Area since the year 1994, as it shares a common border um, with the Betuan Kerehun Nature Reserve in Indonesia. So together they form one of the largest transboundary protected area in the wet tropics. Uh, the area comprises of nearly 1 million hectares of hilly district park forests and are considered an important habitat for the Borneian orangutan, the Pongo pygmaeus pygmaeus. So nearly 30 Iban communities within and near the complex have been documented in existence for over 400 years. And today the complex is considered ecologically important by the conservation community because it contains the only population of orangutans, uh, Pongo pygmaeus pygmaeus, remaining in Sarawak. So prior to the gazetment of the complex, the Iban communities had fully exercised their native customary rights of the area without much interruption by the state. So during my previous field work in the mid 2000s, my team and I, we discovered four orangutan corps that were shot to death in one year alone, uh, sparking a response by the transnational conservation NGO to focus on working with local communities through re-education programs of perceived lost cultural protocols. That includes a general um, taboo of hunting orangutans. So ever since it has been taken for granted by policymakers and conservation NGOs in the state, that the fault remains on the local community level. And as such conservation policies and initiatives have followed this lead. Uh, many communities previously living within or near the complex have, were displaced several decades ago during the gazetting of the protected area after the Batan Ai Dam was built and they've lost most of their rights to access to the complex. And they were encouraged to participate in the government oil palm schemes in nearby rural towns. And this represents a common theme throughout Sarawak and many tropical countries. So for instance, an education campaign that focuses on the law and consequences of killing Amayas, while simultaneously reminding the communities of their obligation, um, obligation to the orangutan, they assign greater conservation responsibility and therefore consequences to the communities. My apologies, I have just mixed up my... So trained by the classic Western tradition, by where nature is in opposition with the, with, with the reason, conservationists generally define the Mayas within a discursively constructed divide that separates humans and nature, revealing a relationship of control and domination. Yet Ibans have categorized the Mayas long before Western and Malaysian biologists had arrived in Batan Aya. So I learned this categorization of the orangutan of Mayas early on in my days of conservation fieldwork in the mid 2000s, but it had no place in the research frameworks that we were taught to use. So in my interviews with conservationists, they emphasized the work in environmental education campaigns that they had run with seven Batan Aya longhouse communities where primary school community children were targeted. So these awareness campaigns included the Western influence plays with theater prop firearm and a long time mascot. And the main objective was to educate um, the rural Ibai communities on the protected status of the Mayas 
and the landscape and to remind the Ivans of their stories of the Mayas. And the central assumption um, guided by the interviews is that the Ivans have seemed to have forgotten their ancestral stories, such as the, the prohibition to, to, not, to kill the Mayas. And the truth is the ban was imposed by a different set of authority, which is, that is the conservation actors. And this is not a nuanced expression of Iban Adat. So to conservationists, the Mayas are the utmost priority to protect and the reason for the presence in Batan Aya. And the conservationists uh, mention a lack of income as a reason for hunting and explain that the sale of wildlife could be offset by transforming would-be hunters into community patrollers. And one conservationist further explained their motives. Indigenous conservation needs to carry in a sick communities want development, and when the right conditions exist, conservation could then be facilitated. Uh, for example, the enlightened ones understand the negative impact of planting all palm on their lands. So the rational order of conservation practice relies on the assumption that education campaigns would correct people's ways. Uh, humans are not understood as part of a healthy ecosystem and their actions need to be constantly monitored and managed. So on the contrary, I argue that recentering indigenous naming of the Mayas enables practices of being with rather than managing of, and such practice places the Mayas in different relations with. So there is a particular logic used by conservationists to view Ibans and other indigenous peoples who live, um, continue to live in rural areas as landowners who have lost their way and do not have sufficient knowledge uh, to manage natural resources in the present day for the benefit of conservation. So to many conservationists, Ibans and other rural indigenous and local populations can continue to threaten wildlife species with their practices in social life. And through conservation logic naming, Iban people and land and more than human beings have been abstracted from the relations and turned into useless complaints. Um, the Mayas, um, for instance, has been categorized into what needs to be protected, totally protected, and why they should be conserved, and thus further disembodied from place in relations with humans. So Ibans have categorized the orangutan long before Western explorers had arrived in Borneo. And for the, um, so when, um, during my days of conservation field work, uh, when I informed my Iban interlocutor that cited a orangutan or a Mayas, I always have to clarify what type of Mayas is it? Is it a Mayas Kusa? Is it a Mayas Rambai? And this method of classification pays attention to where the orangutan is most likely found and its appearance. And this helps the Ibans keep track of which Mayas is currently in what territories. So for the Ibans of Batang Ai, the Mayas have been part of the world through interrelations and interdependency for much longer, much longer than conservation practices as we know for today. And according to Apai, there are several stories that convey their interspecies relationality of the Batangai Ibans and the Mayas. And one of the main story relates to how several hundreds of years ago, the Iban women of his ancestor communities were struggling to give birth safely. And the communities had migrated in search of new lands to live on and were unfamiliar with their territories. And several Ibans, they were on a scouting expedition and they came across a pregnant Mayas eating a particular ginger plant. They returned to the village with this new piece of information. They sought the plant and prepared it for the women in the community who were pregnant. The concoction had helped ease the birthing pains. And since then, the Ibans have credited the Mayas for this particular plant knowledge. So Indai Apai's wife reminds me that up to today, up to uh, today, the women in the community who have moved away from the longhouses and are in, now in towns for marriage or work, they still request the ginger plant. Uh, we boil the plant and they drink it like tea. So the story and its variants have captured the conservationists and tourist guides' attention, although they have sought to dismantle the story from their epistemological origins and reconfigure it into a moralistic fable. We are informed that because of this very special connection with Mayas, Ibans have a moral obligation towards the Rangatan, and particularly for conservation, this idea of moral obligation works in terms of self-regulating um, or well, regulating self-enforcement uh, within communities, i.e. you don't have to pay anybody. So for instance, an education 
a campaign that focuses on the law and consequences of killing the Mayas, while simultaneously reminding communities of their obligation to the longer term. This assigns greater conservation responsibility and therefore consequences to the communities. So within Euro-Western frameworks conservation, for humans are collectively homogenized and colonial structures disregarded, the idea of more than human species reliance on humans for survival persists. But for Apai and many other interlocutors, however, the bias, their story along with the customary taboo against killing Mayas and other wildlife species is part of a reciprocal customary adat that fixes interspecies connections to land and place. So there is no human divine authority over non-human species, nature and place. So the Mayas, the pythons and other animals alike hold responsibilities as do Ibans while living on the same lands. So the Mayas are also expected to uphold the obligation not to destroy their farmers' livelihoods nor harm Ibans themselves. We do not shoot to kill, but we shoot to scare the Mayas and other wildlife away from fruiting trees. And such we can begin to understand and appreciate how the agency of the Mayas or the Rangitan underpins Iban understanding of the universe. Hi, June. Sorry to interrupt, but um, I don't think my alarm worked, but you have a No, it didn't. Yeah, so I'm sorry about that. So four minutes left. Oh, no worries. So the stories that are shared with me by Apai explain to me what he sees as proper ways to, to be in this world and to maintain good relations and belonging, including with more than human species. So, but there's a danger, of course, to disentangled stories from the place context and thus critiquing the bonds for not fulfilling their end of argument. So such a limited and extracted engagement misses the potential to understand how a fuller interspecies relationship could exist and how this reinforces problematic relationships. So I do not intend to argue that these protocols are observed in constant harmony or not to paint an idyllic picture of interspecies relations. So often my interlocutors convey their complex and urgent realities and balancing these with the expectation of conservation actors and other institutions interested in the land practices and social lives. So it is the context of relationships of care and to make kin, following the ideas of Haraway and Kim Tolbert, that the politics of naming could perhaps be best understood. By attending these relations, we can also attend to responsiveness to how we attend or care beyond the imperial mode to constructed care. So I therefore argue it is necessary to consider how we approach indigenous naming, knowledges and stories in conservation work and also in our citational practices. So it's these ideas to know the Mayas beyond to protect, but rather to connect in place that, play, that maintains orangutan relations as more than an abstracted species with conservation value. So in other words, we must know the Mayas beyond its mostly charismatic conservation value and carefully think through its embodied co-relations with place and abundance and other indigenous peoples living in the same lands. Thank you.